Hi folks, this is Shefik. Today we are going to focus on the idea behind RSA encryption algorithm. But before we begin, please like the video, do not forget to subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon to stay up to date with the latest videos. RSA is one of the most popular crypto system nowadays. To be honest, I am not a big fan of RSA encryption algorithm. Elliptic curve cryptography attracts my attention much more. But we cannot discard RSA. It's the pioneer of the public key cryptography. So we have to understand how and why RSA algorithm is working. RSA depends on two important theorems. One is Fermat's little theorem and second is its expanded version Fermat earlier theorem. Today we are going to prove those algorithms to understand how and why RSA encryption algorithm is working. Fermat's Lidl theorem is called Lidl because famous French mathematician Fermat's last theorem can be proven in 350 years. That's why this is called Lidl theorem and he states that a to the power of p minus a is equal to 0 mod p while p is a prime number and a is an integer not divisible by p in other words a and p should be co-primes let's prove this theorem with necklace method and suppose that we are working on an alphabet consisting of eight characters which are 0 to 7 so a is equal to 8 in this case besides we are going to produce all possible strings length of 5 in that case p is equal to 5 thereafter we are going to exclude strings whose all characters are same from the all possible strings the number of all possible strings in this character set is equal to the 8 to the power of 5. How can we find this value? If we have 5 characters, we can put 0 to 7 for the first character, 0 to 7 for the second character, and 0 to 7 for the last character. So this is equal to the 8 to the power of 5, or shortly 8 to the power of p. Now I'm going to exclude strings whose all characters are same from the all possible strings and in the second column I demonstrate the strings whose all characters are same all 0 all 1 or all 7 as you can see there are eight different candidates for this set in other words this is coming from the a so I find all possible strings a to the power of p and thereafter i exclude strings whose all characters are same from this value which is a this subtraction will give us strings consisting of at least two different characters for example all characters can be zero and one item can be one and i can put the number one for the last character or I can switch this different character 1 and this is going to be my second string or I can switch this value 1 to the left I'm going to have this string or I'm going to switch this value 1 to the left or to the left again in all cases I will have 5 different strings similarly if i create characters with all zeros and just one uh, value two i can shift uh, this uh, value one by one and finally i'm going to have five different strings i can create uh, all strings consisting of at least two different characters uh, according to this approach as you can see there are five different strings in this column and there are five different strings in this column and i'm going to always have five different strings for all cases so this column can be divided by p without any remainder and this column can be divided by p without any remainder uh, that's why uh, as you can see uh, a to the power of p minus a can be divided by p without any remainder so we can prove the fermat's little theorem with necklace method in that way when we prove the fermat's little theorem actually i can move the minus uh, a term to the right hand side thereafter i'm going to divide the both sides to value of a and i'm going to have a to the power of p minus one is equal to one 
mod p. In other words, if I divide a to the power of p minus 1 to the p, I'm going to have one remainder value. Thereafter, Fermat's little theorem was generalized by famous Swiss mathematician Euler, and this is called Fermat Euler theorem, or shortly Euler's theorem. And this states that a to the power of quotient n, I'm going to mention what quotient function is, a to the power of quotient n is equal to 1 mod n. Here, a is any integer not divisible by n. In other words, a and n should be relatively primes. But in this case, mod value n, it doesn't have to be a prime value. Euler's quotient function basically counts the positive integer numbers from 1 to n minus 1 and that relatively prime to n. For example, if we want to find the quotient 9 value, we need to count the positive integers up to 9 that relatively prime to value 9. These numbers are 1, 2, 4, 5, 7 and finally 8. So there are 6 different numbers relatively prime to value 9. That's why quotient value of 9 is equal to 6. RSA adopts Euler theorem because it's going to use this feature. If the value of n is a prime number then its quotient value is going to be n minus 1 because we know that all positive integer values should be relatively prime to value of n and finally this is another important feature of quotient function and we are actively using this functionality in RSA algorithm if n can be expressed with multiplication of two numbers that relatively primes then quotient value will be multiplication of its multipliers in other words if p times q is equal to n instead of counting uh, all positive integers up to n i can find quotient value of p and quotient value of q separately and find the multiplication of those sub quotient functions suppose that if I want to find the quotient value of 15, I can express the 15 as 3 times 5. And this is a multiplicative function, I can express this as quotient 3 times quotient 5. And notice that the both 3 and 5 are prime numbers. So uh, quotient value of 3 should be 3 minus 1 and quotient value of 5 should be 5 minus 1 and this is going to be 8. Really those are the positive integer values up to 15 that relatively prime to 15. We have proven the Fermat's little theorem but how Fermat earlier theorem is working. Let's prove this one. Suppose that set S stores numbers uh, relatively prime uh, with n and suppose that there are uh, three different numbers that relatively prime to n. So length of set S should be quotient n as well. Secondly, let's multiply all items of set S by a. This is going to be a new set and I name it as t and uh, this is going to be a times x1, a times x2 and finally a times x3. x values in the set s should be less than value of n because we stored the positive integer numbers up to n in the set s. But a times x values might be greater than the value of n. What's more, we already know that all items in the set s are co-prime to n. Also, a must be co-prime to n because of definition of the Fermat Euler theorem. a is an integer not divisible by n. In other words, a and n are co-primes. So, if I find the mod value for the a times x i variables, then I'm going to have a co-prime uh, with n. But I need to find its mod value as well. Here, I'm going to store those values in the set k and uh, I actually find the mod values of all items in the set T. First item a times x1 mod n, second item a times x2 mod n, and the last item is going to be a times x3 mod n. We know that all items in the set k should be co-prime to n. On the other hand, we already stored the values up to n that co-prime to n in the set t. Let's show those sets here, set k and set s. All items in uh, these both sets must be co-prime to n. a times x1 mod n, this is co-prime to n. Second item is co-prime to n and the last item a times x3 mod n is co-prime to n. Similarly x1 is co-prime 
to n, x2 is co prime to n, and finally x phi is co prime to n. So mappings between those two sets should be one to one and covered on the target set because number of items in both sets are same. What I mean? A times x1 mod n should be connected to or should be equal to x1 or x2 or x phi one item in the set s similarly a times x2 mod n uh, should be equal to x1 or x2 or x phi one item in the set s so let's express uh, those multiplications as x variable values and i know that for example a times x1 mod n is equal to xi and xi is a member of sets s now i'm going to multiply those equations uh, and i'm going to generate just one equation all items in the left hand side should be one item in the set s that's why multiplications of xi xj or xk should be equal to x1 to xp as expressed similarly if i I multiply all items in the right hand side i'm going to have a x1 mod n a x2 mod n a x3 mod n as you can see there are torsion and times a values in the right hand side that's why i can express uh, all these a values as a to the power of torsion n. thereafter i'm going to simplify the x terms in the left and right hand side and it's going to be one is equal to a to the power of torsion n mod n so we can prove the herma earlier theorem with number theory thank you all for watching and see you next time